Hello listeners and welcome to the first program in our five-part series of office practice, which is produced for grade 8, JSC level, learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Evans Kwetemu. Today we will learn about the introduction to office practice and computers. Please be in possession of a pen and a notebook so that you can take note of all the important points that we are going to discuss. Just a reminder, don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. White collar career. It is a dream for most people to have an office job. Having a whole spacious and luxuriously furnished office to yourself, an office with the latest technology and state of the art equipment. With changes in technology, many aspects of life have become practical and is due to this backdrop that students have to be groomed at a young and raw age to be tailor-made for future careers in areas associated with technology. I believe this program will go a long way in bringing closer to home the importance of office practice, a subject that is mostly hands-on than theoretical. At the end of this program, you should be able to number 1. Explain what office practice is and its purpose. Number 2. Explain the advantages and value of the subject. Number 3. Give a definition of a computer and state the different parts of a computer. Hey girl, you're looking gorgeous today. <laughs> Thanks dear, how are you doing? I'm good dear, I can't complain. Do you know what? Yesterday my father asked me about a career I want to pursue when I finish school. My friend, I froze. I couldn't utter a single word. I really don't know what I want, my dear. Me too, dear. I'm yet to decide on that. But I see myself doing a white-collar job, sitting behind a computer in a big company's office and driving the latest SUVs. That's the main reason why I'm taking subjects like office practice seriously. You are smart, girl. I have to also start thinking like a secondary school student and find a career. But that subject called office practice, I'm yet to see its benefits in as far as our future is concerned. Don't worry, you will understand as time goes on. Let us go to class. Hello class, hello. How are you? Let us take our seats quietly and put our books and pens on the desk. You two girls sitting at the front, how are you? We are fine, sir. We were just discussing about the subject, sir. Sylvia said she envisioned herself working in a big office with the latest computers when she finishes school. Wow, that's good, Sylvia. It is advisable to think beyond today and set goals you want to achieve and then strive towards the attainment of those goals. Your obsession with an office just introduced us to the topic we are going to look at today. I want you to understand the subject called office practice. Its main purpose and its value in shaping people's future in as far as careers in the office are concerned. Office practice is the acquisition of skills and a high degree of expertise in operating a computer or word processor in order to obtain the prescribed degree of productivity. The application of computers or word processors has become an integral part of the present day society. And the skill to use a word processor or computer is a major requirement for many vocations and it contributes to efficiency in many other spheres. So Sylvia, what do you think is the main purpose of studying office practice? Um. I think one of its purposes is to provide learners with basic skills of keyboarding and computer literacy. Computer literacy is considered to be a very important skill to possess nowadays, and employers want their workers to have basic computer skills because their company becomes ever more dependent on computers. Office practice also prepares students and makes them ready to enter the job market. Computers are an integral part of professional environment in the 21st century and not knowing how to do basic troubleshooting, typing and word processing can be a drawback for job seekers. 
Thank you, Sylvia. That's a well-articulated response. Mercy, you want to add something? Yes. As they say, practice makes perfect. Office practice gives us the platform to learn how to use computer, which in turn helps us as learners in developing appropriate skills of numeracy, literacy, layout, and keyboard use. Almost every office job nowadays involves data capturing, so office practice also helps learners to develop the essential characteristics of efficient typists, which include logical thought processes, neatness, order lines, thoroughness, and accuracy. Thank you, Mercy. We now know the definition of office practice and the purpose of having this subject in our curriculum. So next, we want to look at the benefits and value of the subject called office practice. I can give you the first benefit, then you will help me with the other benefits. Office practice instills in the learners a basic knowledge of the computer or word processor and enables them to utilize it. Knowing and understanding how to utilize word processors can help in improving efficiency and accuracy. Word processors contain software to automatically correct common errors and identifying misspellings, improving overall speed and reducing errors. They also make it easier to create and organize new files as well as retrieve and manipulate existing ones. Let me try, sir. Go ahead, Missy. Office practice helps the learner to be able to use touch typing to type letters or words and tactually locate other keys on extended keyboard. Touch typing is the ability to use muscle memory to find keys fast without using the sense of sight. Touch typing improves an individual's typing speed and accuracy, which enables a typist to complete her tasks on time. Touch typing also increases your job prospects, as many employers require computer skills and a certain typing speed to even be considered for some positions. Sir, let me also add another point. Go ahead. It helps learners develop positive attitudes towards technology and uses that to support lifelong learning, collaboration, personal pursuits, and productivity. Once the learners embrace technology, they can use it in self-motivated pursuits of knowledge for either personal or professional reason. Wow, that is splendid, guys. Let me help you with another benefit. Office practice gives the learners a good understanding of the importance of keyboard skills in the business world in general and consequent contribution to effective management. For most jobs, keyboarding is a good skill to have. Jobs that uses computers often require keyboarding as an important skill. If one is able to type quick, tasks and jobs that require typing documents or assignment can be completed faster. Mercy, your hand is up. You may go ahead with your contribution. Office practice develops the logical thought processes and analytical abilities of learners. Logical thinking and analytical skills are important because they allow a learner to find solutions to common problems and make decisions about what actions to take next. Understanding problems and analyzing the situations for viable solutions is a key skill in every position at every level. Thank you guys. It really shows that you now know the importance and the value of office practice. But without computers, there is no office practice. Can anyone tell us what a computer is? A computer is an electronic device that accepts data or input, process the data, produce data and store or storage the results. That is great, Sylvia. Now, I want you to list the path of a computer. In this lesson, we are just listing and we shall look deep into them in future lessons. Mercy, I want you to give us all the computer hardware components that you know and Sylvia, you will also give us examples of software that you know. Uh, 
I don't quite understand what you mean by hardware and software. Okay. Computer hardware is any physical device used in or with your computer, whereas software is a collection of programming code installed in your computer hard drive. So in other words, you mean to say hardware is something you can hold in your hand, whereas software can't be held in your hand. That is very correct, Sylvia. So girls, give me the parts I asked for. I will start with you, Mercy. Okay, sir. Hardware parts includes the monitor, mm -hmm. mouse, printer, mm -hmm. keyboard, power supply, memory stick, central processing unit, or the CPU, and the speakers. Good, 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 good. But sir, you gave Mercy an easy task because hardware components are very easy to identify. But anyway, let me try. Microsoft suit products like Word and Excel, internet browsers like Firefox and Chrome, and mobile pieces of software like Skype and Zoom. Thank you guys, I'm so proud of you. I have no doubt, Sylvia, you will surely get the white collar job in a big company. Mercy, we are still waiting for your career job. Don't worry sir, I'll let you know soon. Today I learned a lot. I learned that office practice instills in the learners a basic knowledge of the computer or word processor and enables them to utilize it. Office practice also prepares students and makes them ready to enter the job market. Computer literacy is considered a very important skill to possess nowadays and employers want their workers to have basic computer skills because their company becomes ever more dependent on computers. A computer is an electronic device that accepts data or input processes the data, produces data, and stores the results. Thank you, sir. I will definitely work towards the fulfillment of my dream. I learned a lot today. I learned that office practice develops the logical thought process and analytical abilities of learners, and that computer hardware is any physical device used in or with your computer, whereas software is a collection of programming code installed in your computer hard drive. Well, well, that brings us to the end of today's session. Before class is dismissed, here is your question for the day. Computer applications like Opera Mini are which part of a computer? A. Hardware B. Software This program was written by Evans Kwetemu. So until next time, goodbye for now. This program was brought to you brought by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture in the Commonwealth of Learning. Hello listeners and welcome to the second program in our series, Let's Learn Office Practice, which is produced for JSC Grade 8 learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Evans Kwetemu. Today we will learn about the computer hardware and software. Please have a pen and notebook ready so that you can make notes of the important points. And don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Technology has been able to bring the whole world together into a global village. 
The use of computers has made work easier in manufacturing, retailing, and even service industry. It will be an injustice to talk of technology without mentioning the role that is being played by both the computer hardware and computer software. At the end of this program, you should be able to 1. Explain how computers have developed. 2. Define computer software and computer hardware. 3. Identify and explain the function of the following hardware components. Monitor, keyboard, system unit including memory, mouse and printer. Huh. My dad always says that my elder brother was obsessed with computers from an early age. Sometimes he could sneak into my dad's home office to play with his desktop until my father decided to buy him a personal computer. And I study information technology at the University of Namibia. What'd you say? I understand what you mean, David. That reminds me of my sister who is now in China. She used to confuse us with words like tabulation, PowerPoint, and Microsoft Word. When is our office practice lesson? Hmm, ish, 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 ish. It's an upcoming period. Let us rush or Mr. Lambert will humiliate us in front of everybody, you know? <laughs> Good morning, class. Can we all take our respective seats? David and Elvis, do I need to always remind you each and every day that a student has to be punctual at all times? I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen at all. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. We lost track of time discussing about computers. Eh? Okay, okay. Anyway, thank you, guys. You just took us to our lesson for today. We will be discussing the development of computers, computer hardware, and software. So who wants to start with what we have heard or read about the development of computers? Me, sir. Yes, David, you may go ahead. What I understand is that the computer was not born for entertainment or emails, but out of a need to solve serious number crunching crisis. By 1880, the U.S. population has grown so large that it took more than seven years to tabulate the U.S. census results. The government sought a faster way to get the job done, giving rise to punch card based computer that took up entire rooms. Computers have evolved and advanced significantly over decades since they originated. Many years ago, they were very large and slow. Gradually, they have become smaller and faster, enabling people to use them virtually anywhere. Hmm, but if I'm not mistaken, David is talking about desktops. So when was the personal computer invented or developed, huh? Okay, let me help thee. The history of the personal computer as a mass market consumer electronic device began with the microcomputer revolution of the 1970s. A personal computer is one intended for interactive individual use. After the development of the microprocessor, individual personal computers were low enough in cost that they eventually became affordable consumer goods, generally called microcomputers. Mm, well articulated, sir. Thank you. So what is the difference between a computer hardware and a computer software? <laughs> Computer hardware refers to the physical elements of a computer. Those are tangible. Examples of hardware in a computer include the keyboard, the monitor, the mouse, the hard drive, memory stick, printer, power supply unit, main memory or RAM, and the central processing unit, CPU. On the other hand, computer software refers to the set of instructions and documentations that tell us a computer what to do or how to perform a task. Examples of softwares include internet browsers like Firefox and Chrome, Microsoft products, Office, Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, etc. etc. Okay, thank you, Elvis. Let me add a few words for you to understand much because you may wonder where the names and software originated from. Hardware is so termed because it is hard or rigid with respect to changes, whereas software is so termed soft because it is easy to change. 
Hardware is typically directed by the software to execute any command or instruction. A combination of hardware and software forms a usable computing system. You raised a good point on examples of computer hardware. As a student studying office practice, you must be in a position to identify and explain the functions of the following hardware components. The monitor, the keyboard, system unit, including memory, mouse, and the printer. Mm. Keyboard is an input device used to enter characters and functions into a computer system by pressing buttons or keys. It contains keys for individual letters, numbers, and special characters. Keyboard is used as a text entry interface for typing text, numbers, and symbols into a word processor, text editor, or any other program. To add on what David just said, a keyboard is also used to give commands to the operating system of a computer, such as Windows Control, Alt, Delete combination. Elvis, can you help us to explain what a mouse is? Yes, sir. A mouse is an input device that is used with a computer. Moving a mouse along a flat surface can move the course of the different items on the screen. Items can be moved or selected by pressing the mouse buttons called clicking. <laughs> okay, thank you Elvis. Though you just mentioned a cursor without telling us what it is. A cursor is a movable indicator on a computer screen identifying the point that will be affected by input from the user. So what is the screen of a computer called? We call that screen a monitor. A monitor is an output device that displays text, video, and other information. The function is to accurately and clearly display the programs, software or video being shown to the user. A monitor usually comprises the visual display, circuitry, casing, and power supply. David, you want to add something? Um, no, sir. I want to talk about a printer. A printer is an external hardware output that takes electronic data stored on a computer or other device and generates a hard copy of it. It seems I have a team of students who are studying. That is very good. Mm -hmm. If you keep this level up, you will make me proud. Mm -hmm. Let me illustrate on computer memory. Computer memory is any physical device capable of storing information temporarily, like RAM, that is random access memory or permanently like ROM, which is read only memory. Memory devices utilize integrated circuits and are used by operating systems, software and hardware. Computer memory is made up of two basic types. That is primary memory, that is RAM and ROM and secondary memory, hard drive, CD, etc. Sir, what is the difference between a RAM and ROM? Oh, okay. That's a good question, Elvis. ROM, which is read-only memory, is a type of non-volatile memory used in computers and other electronic devices. Data stored in ROM cannot be electronically modified after the manufacture of the memory device. It is used to store data that is rarely changed during the life of the system. Correction of errors or updates to the software requires new device to be manufactured and to replace the installed device. Random access memory or RAM is a form of computer memory that can be read and changed in any order, typically used to store working data and machine code. A random access memory device allows data items to be read and written or written in almost the same time irrespective of the physical location of data inside the memory. Unlike ROM, RAM is usually associated with volatile types of memory where stored information is lost if power is removed. Hmm, allow me to ask again, sir. What about the storage capacity of ROM and RAM? Okay, that's a good question again. A ROM chip stores several megabytes of data, usually four to eight per chip whereas a RAM chip can store multiple gigabytes of data, ranging from one to 256 gigabytes per chip. Let me also add this difference with an example. 
A ROM chip is used primarily in the startup process of a computer, whereas a RAM chip is used in the normal operations after the operation system is loaded. For example, a ROM chip is often used to store BIOS program on the computer motherboard. A RAM chip temporarily stores files in use on a computer, like a document you are writing, an image you are editing, or data for a game you are playing. It was great, sir. I have learned so much today. I learned that computer hardware refers to the physical elements of a computer, those that are tangible, whilst computer software refers to a set of instructions and documentations that tells a computer what to do or how to perform a task. That computers were once big enough to fill rooms and have evolved to become smaller and can now be easily carried around. A keyboard is not only used to enter letter, numbers, symbols, but can also be used to give commands to the operating system of a computer, such as Windows Control Alt Delete combination. Computer memory is made up of two basic types, primary, RAM, and ROM, and secondary memory, hard drive, CDs, etc. Very good. Over to you, Elvis. Thank you very much, sir. I learned that a ROM chip stores several megabytes of data, usually 4 to 8 per chip, whereas a RAM chip can store a multiple gigabytes of data, ranging from 1 to 256 gigabytes per chip. Read-only memory is non-volatile, meaning stored data is not lost even if power is lost, and random access memory is volatile, meaning stored information is lost if the power is removed. Internet browsers like Chrome and Firefox are part of a computer software, sir. Thank you very much, guys. And this brings us to the end of today's program. But as usual, before we say goodbye, here's the question of the day. Computer speakers fall under A. Computer hardware B. Computer software This program was written by Evans Kwetemu So until next time, take care This program was brought to you by Namcor With funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture And the Commonwealth of Learning Greetings to all the listeners and welcome to the third program in our five-part series of Office Practice, which is produced for grade 8 JSC level learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Evans Kwetemu. Today we will learn about the use and maintenance of computers. Please be in possession of a pen and a notebook so that you can take note of all the important points that we are going to discuss. Just a reminder. Don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Computers are used for most of the things in our everyday life and in the upcoming time in future. Computers are going to be everything in everyone's life on which life will depend on badly. Computers are used for typing and processing of data, for banking purposes, encoding and programming, in hospitals like ICU, for designing, in business and marketing, storing important data, and for communication among other things. For computers to carry out the above mentioned purposes, they need to be maintained. Computer maintenance is the practice of keeping our computers in a good state. A computer containing accumulated dust may not run properly. 
Knowing how to shut down your computer properly is another way of maintaining your computer. At the end of this program, you should be able to number one, explain the advantages of touch typing versus sight typing. Number two, name and explain the maintenance rules of a computer. Number three, shut down or logging off a computer properly. Oh, look who's here. Hi. How are you, Merlin? I'm good. How are you? Fine, fine. It has been long since I last saw you. How was your holiday? My holiday was awesome. Productive and educative. I visited my cousin in Chuma, and she is an executive secretary at a big private company. She taught me how to type very fast without looking at the keyboard. I was surprised that someone can even type without looking at the keyboard. Mmm, Merlin, typing without looking at the keyboard. Is that even possible? Mm. Yes, it is possible. Unfortunately, her computer broke down. I could possibly be the best typist ever now. The breakdown was caused by the way she handled her computer. She never maintained it properly. She even confessed that sometimes she couldn't shut it down properly, but could log it off with some programs still running. But I didn't understand what the best way of shutting down a computer is. Hey, let's go to class. You will tell me more after the lesson. Good morning, good morning class. Welcome to the brand new term. I believe we all had a great and entertaining holiday. Please take your seats and let us start today's lesson. Maurice, your face is beaming. Do you want to share with us what you learned during the recent school holiday? I have nothing to share, sir. I only wanted to ask about what Melin just told me. She was saying someone can type without looking at the computer keyboard. <laughs> Yes, 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 it is possible, Mr. Morris. You will understand after the lesson. Today, we are going to learn about sight typing and touch typing. We will also learn about the best way to maintain our computer and to make sure that when you log off your computer, you do that in a proper way that will not endanger your computer in the long run. I think I know something about touch typing, which is also called touch type or touch keyboarding. It refers to typing without using the sense of sight to find the keys. Specifically, a touch typist will know the location of the keys on the keyboard through muscle memory. Wow, wow. Someone had a fruitful holiday here. Thank you, Marlene. To add on what Marlene said, touch typing involves placing the eight fingers in a horizontal row along the middle row of the keyboard and having them reach for specific other keys. Both two-handed and one-handed touch typing are possible. The typist keeps their eyes on the source copy at all times. Hmm, I think sight typing is opposite of touch typing, huh? Yes, it is, Maurice. Yes, it is. Sight typing is typing technique in which instead of relying on the memorized position of keys, the typist finds each key by sight and moves the finger over to press it, usually the index finger of their dominant hand. So between the two, which one is more beneficial or more advisable than the other? Good question. Touch typing is advisable more than sight typing because unlike sight typing, it improves an individual's typing speed and accuracy, which enables a typist to complete a task on time. Touch typing also results in reduced switched attention as a touch typist does not need to move sight between the keyboard that may be poorly lit and other areas that need attention. Another advantage of touch typing over sight typing is that it reduces neck strain by making the typist focused on the display and avoiding constant need to glance at the keyboard. Typing is not an optional skill anymore. Many employers they require computer skills and a certain typing speed to even be considered for some positions. Hence, touch typing improves an employee's job prospects. Oh, thank you, sir. Marlin was talking about computer maintenance. What is it all about? Huh? Marlin, you want to try? No, thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Computer maintenance is all about keeping our computers in a good state of repair. A computer containing accumulated dust and debris 
may not work properly. Dust and debris will accumulate as a result of air cooling. Any filters used to mitigate this need regular service and changes. If the cooling system is not filtered, then regular computer cleaning may prevent overheating. Computer maintenance is very important so as to prevent the breakdown of a computer and problems like data loss. Anyone to help us with the ways through which we can maintain our computers? Keep the keyboard clean as crumbs, dust and particles that fall between the keys and build underneath may lead to the keys being sticky. So they are loosened by spraying pressurized air into the keyboard and then removed with a low pressure vacuum cleaner. Although optical mouse usually require far less maintenance than their mechanical counterparts, it does need cleaning once in a while. The top surface of the mouse is wiped with a plastic cleaner to remove the dirt that accumulates from the hand. The bottom surface is also cleaned to ensure that it can slide freely. Mm. Gently cleaning your monitor using a soft and clean cloth, the monitor might seem solid enough, but it is just as vulnerable to dust and debris as the keyboard and the ports. Periodically removed with a microfiber cloth and a tougher stains are removed by LCD screen cleaners. Malware and viruses are some of the problems affecting the computers users today. Get the anti-malware software and antivirus, especially to laptops which are vulnerable to viruses, to protect your computers and your files. That's awesome, guys. I also want to add and emphasize on one of the most common substances that usually damage our computers. Food and beverages. Food particles may fall into movable parts of a computer and damage them. Liquids and beverages may spill into the computer, causing rusting or electrical faults. So, please keep food and beverages away from desktops and laptops. Repeat after me. Don't eat or drink over your desktop or laptop. Together. Don't, don't eat or drink, or drink over your, your desktop or laptop. laptop. That is good. Don't overcharge your batteries as this will destroy your battery life. Unnecessary charging actually retards batteries' regenerative capabilities. Sometime later, you will notice a drop-off in your device's ability to hold a charge. Another way to maintain your computer is never to block the vents on your computer because just like people, computers need to breathe. The vents ensure the device's insides remain cool enough to function properly. Sir, you can add the others. <laughs> okay. Keep magnets away because the hard drive is sensitive to magnetic fields of any strength. Operating system files such as Windows, Registry, may require maintenance and Registry Cleaner may be used for this. Software packages and operating systems may require regular updates to correct software bugs and to address security weaknesses. Always shut down your computer properly every day and every night. Uninstall programs completely. You need to execute a formal uninstall process for every single application you want to get rid of. Tossing things in the trash or recycle bin doesn't cut them. Use the application's own uninstaller if it exists. Sir, what do you mean by shutting down your computer properly every night? Oh, and every day as well. Don't forget that. Okay. Okay, let us look on the last part of today's lesson, which is about shutting down or logging off a computer. To shut down or power off is to remove power from a computer's main components in a controlled way. After a computer is shut down, main components such as the CPU, the RAM and hard disk drives are powered down although some internal components such as internal clock may retain power. It is very important that you shut down your system properly. Simply turning the power off with the power switch can cause serious file system damage. While the system is on, files are in use even if you are not doing anything. Remember, 
There are many processes running in the background all the time. These processes are managing the system and keep a lot of files open. When the power is switched off, these files are not closed properly and may become corrupted. Thank you, sir. Welcome. I used to turn off my dad's desktop by turning the power off. So what is the best way to shut down a computer? You were not alone on that, Marlin. I hope you will not do that again. When shutting down a computer, make sure all the programs are closed. Press the Windows key on the keyboard or click Start. The Start menu opens. Click Shut Down button. Thank you, sir. Today I learned that computers have to be powered off properly, not by simply turning the power off. A typist can type without looking at the keyboard, and I have to stop eating and drinking over my dad's computer. <laughs> that is good, that is good. Yes, Mr. Morris, what have you to say? I also learned that there are two typing techniques, touching typing and side typing. How shutting down a computer in an improper way damage my computer and or corrupt my files? Food particles may fall into movable parts of a computer and damage them. Liquids and beverages may spill into the computer causing rusting and electrical faults. Okay, and that brings us to the end of today's session. But as always, before the class is dismissed, here is the question for the day. Which one is the fastest typing technique? A. Touch typing B. Sight typing This program was written by Evans Kwetemu So until next time, it's goodbye for now This program was brought to you brought by Namcor with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning Good day, listeners, and welcome to the fourth program in our five-part series of Office Practice, which is produced for grade 8 JSC level learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Evans Kwetemu. Today, we will learn about the computer storage devices. Please be in possession of a pen and a notebook so that you can take note of all the important points that we are going to discuss. Just a reminder, don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Computer data storage is a technology consisting of computer components and recording media that are used to retain digital data. Without a significant amount of memory, a computer would merely be able to perform fixed operations and immediately output the result. At the end of this program, you should be able to number one, distinguish between a memory stick, flash drive, and a hard drive. Number two, name and apply the rules for the maintenance of storage devices, for example, memory stick, external hard drives. Number three, explain storage devices, formatting, and its benefits. Hi, John. How are you? You look sad. What's the problem? Hi, Ndeshi. I am not fine, my dear. We could not sleep the whole night yesterday. My younger brother accidentally formatted my elder sister's memory stick. My sister kept all her schoolwork, including the project for a degree program, in that storage device. She was inconsolable and was crying the whole night. That's so sad. I don't know much about computers, but I pray she'll get all her lost files back. Maybe we should ask Mr. Lombard if that can be done. 
Good afternoon, class. Please, please, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Huh. Deshi and John, we don't talk or even whisper in class. Can you share with us what you are talking about? Sorry, sir. John's little brother accidentally formatted his elder sister's storage device containing all her schoolwork, including her project for her degree program. He's worried her sister may not be able to get all her files back. Oh, 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 oh. I'm very sorry for you and your sister. She can still get her work if she had backed up. Okay, class. Unknowingly, our colleagues Neshi and John have introduced us to our lesson for today on storage devices. To start off with, who can tell us the meaning of storage device? Me, sir. Okay, go ahead. Does it not refer to a computing hardware used to store information permanently or temporarily? Mm, mm, mm. Yes, it does. Well done, well done, Deshi. There are two types of storage devices. That is primary storage device and secondary storage device. Primary storage device is a medium that holds memory for short periods of time while a computer is running. It is quite smaller in size and it is designed to capture or hold data for a temporary period. Most primary storage devices are found inside the computer and they have the fastest access to data. Can also be referred to as internal memory, main memory and primary memory. Examples of primary storage devices include catch memory and random access memory, that is RAM. Primary storage's key difference from others are that it is directly accessible by the central processing unit or the CPU, it is volatile and is non-removable. Secondary storage is a non-volatile device that holds data until it is deleted or underwritten. Secondary storage device has a larger storage capacity and can store data permanently. Secondary storage device is about two orders of magnitude cheaper than primary storage. It can also be referred to as external memory and auxiliary storage. The device can be both internal and external to a computer and includes compact disk or CD, USB drive, hard disk, etc. There she? Oh, so it means John's sister's storage device falls under secondary storage device. That is correct. Very good. And today we want to look also on the difference between a memory stick or flash drive and a hard drive. Uh, though both flash disk or memory stick and hard drive can both be used to expand the memory of a personal computer and both types of storage can keep their data even when the power to the device is turned off. They have their differences. Flash drives store more memory by flashing into the cells of the memory chip, while hard drives store memory with a spinning platter and a rotating head. Another difference is that hard drives can have bigger memory capacity than flash drives, and in such can hold more data. Hard drives are cheaper than flash drives. Another difference is that flash drives don't require a power source for memory storage, while hard drives do. Thank you, John and Deshi. I want to add on common problems encountered with storage devices. First is hardware failure, which is one of the most problematic issues affecting the users. Appropriate handling and regular maintenance can be used to prolong the durability of storage devices. Another problem is data loss which can be accidental, like what happened to John's sister, and intentional data deletion leading to data loss. Data recovery programs provide solutions for files lost, deleted data, corrupt documents, and hidden files. Very informative, sir. But sir, how can we make sure our storage devices last longer or are preserved or maintained so as to minimize data loss? Okay, good question, John. Very good question. Data storage devices are very important because they carry files and documents useful to your personal life and your business. 
Careless handling of such devices may result in loss of valuable data. It is for this reason that every computer user and the owner should be aware of ways to maintain their data storage devices. Avoid placing your removable disks on top of other electronic devices like a TV set, computer, or a gaming platform for a long time as this may lead to data damage. Keep it safe. No matter how hard you try protecting your devices, they must wear and tear. To protect yourself from losing essential data, keep it safe in different locations. Maintain the integrity of your files by monitoring what goes in and out of the drive to prevent viruses from affecting your information. At times, malware and spyware can find their way in the drive without your knowledge. Visiting sites known for malware like adult sites can lead to viruses getting on your computer storage. Keep your storage devices within room temperature. A lot of heat causes melting of electronic elements in the drive. Extreme weather, on the other hand, disintegrates the physical attributes of this device. Make sure the place of storage has enough air supply and proper ventilation to avoid damaging your devices with moisture or heat. And the last one, make it a point to eject your devices safely and properly. Sir? Yes. What did you mean when you said make it a point to eject devices safely and properly? John? Let me try, sir. One have to make sure he or she has safely removed the storage devices from the computer. Many people just detach it. By ejecting, you will be protecting your data from sudden loss by doing this. Pulling the USB or memory card from the PC after use results in full damage of the disk. Thanks, John. That's very correct. You were talking of a storage device that was accidentally formatted. What is meant by disk formatting? Deshi, you want to try? Sure. Disk formatting is a process of preparing a data storage device such as a hard disk drive, solid state drive, floppy disk, or USB flash drive for initial use, or removing anything on the storage device. Wow, I'm so impressed. Although John and his family are lamenting the lost data, but did you know that formatting of storage devices is also beneficial? Ah, how so? Yes, it really helps in a number of ways. Formatting is an effective way of wiping data from storage devices with speed and efficiency. It also helps erase all data previously stored on the storage device. It may also be used as a last-ditch effort for troubleshooting when other methods fail. Mm, now I understand, sir. Though the term troubleshooting is a big word for me. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. Troubleshooting is just an electronic and mechanical system of tracing and correcting faults. Thank you, sir. Today I learned that there are primary and secondary storage devices. Always eject your storage device when removing it from a computer. Don't just pull it out or detach. Formatting of storage device has some benefits. I learned that there are two types of storage devices. That is primary storage device and secondary storage device. Flash drives store memory by flashing into the cells of the mem memory chip, while hard drives store memory with a spinning platter and a rotating head. I should avoid placing my removable disk on top of other electronic devices like a TV set, computer, or a gaming platform for a long time as this may lead to data damage. My sister's formatted storage device falls under secondary storage devices, which is called external memory or auxiliary memory. That is very good. Thank you guys for your contributions today. I very much appreciate that one. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's session once again. But as usual, before class is dismissed, let us hear the question of the day. Question. What is the best way of removing storage device from a computer? A. Eject B. Pull 
or detach. This program was written by Evans Kotemu. So until next time, blessed day. This program was brought to you brought by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning. Greetings listeners and welcome to the fifth program in our five-part series of Office Practice which is produced for grade 8 JSC level learners and anybody else who has an interest in the subject. My name is Evans Kwetemu. Today we will learn about the properties of storage media. Please be in possession of a pen and a notebook so that you can take note of all the important points that we are going to discuss. Just a reminder, don't forget to take part in the quiz at the end of the program. Storage media keeps data, information, and instructions for use in the future. All computers use storage to keep the software that makes the hardware work. As a user, you store a variety of data and information on your computer or on storage media. Storage media are the physical materials on which data, information, and instructions are kept. Media used in computer storage receives messages in the form of data via software from the computer system. The commands determine the type of storage media needed to hold the data based on its business value, compliance implications, or other factors. At the end of this program, you should be able to Explain the following features of storage media. That is accessibility, mutability, addressability, volatile, and non-volatile. How are you, Samantha? I'm well. I have been looking for you everywhere for the whole day, but I couldn't find you. Where were you? That means you didn't search everywhere. I was in the computer lab trying to type my project on a school desktop and unfortunately the school ran out of prepaid electricity while I was typing. Oh, so it means you have lost all the information you were typing and have to start all over again? My sister says I might retrieve the information if the storage device is non-volatile, but I don't understand what you were saying. I have heard about that. But we have a class now. We will definitely get the answers in class. Can we all take our seats in silence, please? Silence, silence, please. Good morning, class. Uh, Madam Samantha, why are you wearing a very long face? Is something bothering you? I was typing my project and lost everything because the power cut. And my sister told me something about volatile media storage. But I didn't understand it. It's okay, young lady. You are the most fortunate person today because we are going to look at the features of storage media. Storage media is any technology, including devices and materials, used to place, keep, and retrieve electronic data. Storage technologies at all levels of the storage hierarchy can be differentiated by evaluating certain core features and volatility is one of these features. So my sister was right after all. So sir, what is volatility all about? Mm, that's a good question, Samantha. Volatility consists of two types that is volatile and non-volatile memory. Volatile memory is computer memory that requires power to maintain the stored information. It retains 
its contents while powered on, but when the power is interrupted, the stored data is quickly lost. For example, random access memory, which is called RAM, is volatile. When you are working on a document, it is kept in RAM. And if the computer loses power, your work will be lost. It is one of the fastest memory technologies. Mm. So, sir, since primary storage is required to be very fast, it predominantly uses volatile memory? Yes, you are right. Now you know all about volatile memory. Can someone tell us about non-volatile memory? Moses, your hand is still up. Go ahead. Non-volatile memory is the opposite of volatile memory. Non-volatile is computer memory that will retain the stored information even if it's not constantly supplied with electric power. Non-volatile memory is the device which keeps the data even when the current is off. It is suitable for long-term storage of information. Samantha? Sir, you gave us random access memory, RAM, as an example of volatile memory. Are there any examples of non-volatile memory? Yes, Samantha, there are a number of them. Examples of non-volatile memory includes flash memory, read-only memory, most types of magnetic computer storage devices like hard disk drives, floppy disks, and magnetic tape, and optical disks. Can any one of you two give us another feature of storage media? Yes. Mutability, sir. Mutability allows information to be overwritten at any time. A computer without some amount of read or write storage for primary purposes would be useless for many tasks. Modern computers typically use read or write storage also for secondary storage. Sam, you want to add? No, thank you, sir. Okay. There are three types of mutability which are read or write storage, which allows information to be overwritten at any time. A computer without some amount of read or write storage for primary purposes will be useless for many tasks. It is also called mutable storage. The second type is read-only storage, which retains the information stored at the time of manufacture and write once storage or worm allows the information to be written only once at some time after manufacture. These are also called immutable storage. The third type is slow write, fast read storage, which allows information to be overwritten multiple times, but with the write operation being much slower than the read operation. Ah, thank you, sir. I only knew mutability, but didn't know about its types. Sir, yes? allow me to add another feature of storage media. Go ahead. Which is addressability. Addressability is the way in which the computer identifies different memory locations. Mm. Thank you, Samantha. Like other features, addressability has three types. The first type is location addressable, for which each individual... Uh, take two. The first type is location addressable, for which each individually accessible unit of information storage is selected with its numerical memory address. The second is file addressable, in which information is divided into files of variable length and a particular file is selected with human readable directory and file names. The third and final one is content addressable, in which each individually accessible unit of information is selected based on the basis of the contents stored there. Moses, your hand is up. Do you want to say something? Yes, sir. I want to add another feature, which is accessibility. Accessibility has two types. The first one is random access, in which any location in storage can be accessed at any moment in approximately the same amount of time. This feature is well suited for primary and secondary storage. The second one is sequential access in which the accessing 
pieces of information will be in a serial order, one after the other. Therefore, the time to access a particular piece of information depends upon which piece of information was last accessed. Mm. Well done, Moses. Well done, well done. Though you rushed into the types of accessibility without telling us what accessibility means. Accessibility means any location in storage media can be accessed at any moment in approximately the same amount of time. This feature is well suited for primary and secondary storage. Sam, you have something to say? Thank you very much, sir. Today I learned that when you are working on a document using volatile memory, it's kept in RAM. And if the computer loses power, your work will be lost. Volatile memory is the fastest memory technology. Non-volatile memory is suitable for long-term storage of information. Well done. Mr. Moses, you have something to say? Yes, sir. I also learned that storage media is any technology, including devices and materials used to place, keep, and retrieve electronic data. Random access memory, RAM, is an example of volatile memory. Mutability allows information to be overwritten at any time. Well done. So this brings us to the end of today's session once again. But as usual, before we call it a day, let us have our question of the day. And once again, we are going to take this as homework. Question. A memory stick is an example of A. Volatile memory B. Non-volatile memory. This program was written by Evans Kotemu. So until next time, goodbye and stay blessed. This program was brought to you by Namcol with funding from the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture and the Commonwealth of Learning.